Thank you. I'm Dennis Watkins. I'm Head of Public Programs here at Sydney Opera House and co-curator with Simon Longstaff of the festival. And, uh, of course, that's brought to you by Sydney Opera House and the St James Ethics Centre. Uh, the speaker for this talk, Unfit for Life, Genetically Enhanced Humanity or Face Extinction, is Julian Savalescu. Professor Savalescu was born in Geelong. He holds the Uhira Chair in Practical Ethics at the University of Oxford. He's the director of the Oxford Uhiro Centre for Practical Ethics within the Faculty of Philosophy. He is also director of the Oxford Centre for Neuroethics, which is one of three strategic centres in biomedical ethics in the UK, funded by the Wellcome Trust. In 2009, he was awarded the title of Monash Distinguished Alumni for Outstanding Achievement, and he was also selected recently as the winner of the Thinkers category of the Australian Newspaper's Top 100 Emerging Leaders Awards, and that was presented by the Prime Minister not so long ago at Parliament House. He's also presented at conferences across the world, including the World Economic Forum at Davos in uh, 2009 and the Mont Pelerin Society's annual meeting in Tokyo in 2008. Uh, a very distinguished uh, man with many, many uh, books, uh, articles and uh, appearances, and uh, here he is for you tonight, Julian Savalescu. Thanks very much, Dennis. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the um, Sydney Opera House and the St James Ethics Centre for this opportunity to be here. I'd like to also acknowledge uh, a co-author on this work, Professor Ingemar Persson from Sweden. We're working on this project together uh, over the next year or so. So the famous uh, physicist Stephen Hawking uh, several years ago ran an unusual poll uh, over the internet. He asked people, how can the human race survive the next 100 years? And at the end of his poll, uh, he was asked by the Guardian newspaper to, to answer his question and to answer the question of what represent the major threats to continued human existence. And, and Hawking went through a, a now usual list that include, uh, included asteroid strikes, nuclear war, climate change, accidental or intentional release of genetically engineered viruses. He completed his um, quotation to The Guardian with the, with the following statement. There's a sick joke that the reason we haven't been visited by aliens is that when a civilization reaches our stage of development, it becomes unstable and destroys itself. The long-term survival of the human race will be safe only if we spread out into space and then to other stars. This won't happen for at least 100 years, so we have to be very careful. Perhaps we must hope that genetic engineering will make us wise and less aggressive. So what does it mean to make us wise and less aggressive? Uh, could we be made wiser and less aggressive? And, and should we make ourselves wiser and less aggressive? In the talk tonight, I'm going to argue that humanity is unfit for the future. And I'm going to introduce the dangerous idea of fitness. And by fitness, I mean the fit between our nature that is our dispositions to, to act and to be, and the external world, either the social or natural world. And that fitness is a fitness to re realise some valuable outcome, usually survival or reproduction in evolutionary terms. I'm going to argue that we're about to enter what could be called a Bermuda Triangle of extinction. And at the corners of this Bermuda Triangle are not um, Miami, Bermuda and um, Puerto Rico, but radical technological power, liberal democracy, and human moral nature. I want to focus on human beings as animals and to ask what are their dispositions to act morally and what are their limitations. And I'm going to argue that there's good reason to believe we have very significant moral limitations. Limitations that may well not have expressed themselves through our history and indeed throughout human history may have been beneficial to our survival as a species. But in the century of unprecedented technological power and in a world of liberal democracy, they represent a liability. Now, I'm going to give you a quick digression because I think it's um, a little bit more positive than the rest of the talk and um, it might be something that all of you are interested in. I'm going to give you an argument now as an example of this concept of fitness that humans are unfit for love. What I mean by that is that we're unfit for the goal that many religions and many people hold dear of a lifelong monogamous relationship. In fact, 
Uh, Till death do us part is no longer the case. Divorce has overtaken death uh, as the major cause for marital breakup, and up to 50% of relationships end in divorce. And this instability in relationships is constant across cultures in both pre-industrial and post-industrial societies. Now, why is it? How can we explain this failure of humans to continue their pair bond and continue to stay in a relationship until death? Well, one explanation is that our biology is not suited to such relationships. We are essentially adapted biologically and psychologically to an environment called the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, which essentially correlates with Pleistocene hunter-gatherer existence. So while our society and technology has rapidly changed, especially in the last 10,000 years, our biology and our psychology has remained relatively constant over the last 100,000 years. And of course, human lifespan today is far longer than in that Pleistocene environment, mainly due to reductions in risks and better health. In that original environment to which we're adapted, many marriages ended in death. What would have been the length of an average mar marriage through most of human history? Well, given a life expectancy in the order of 30 years and assuming young marriages in the teens, at least 50% of marriages have ended within 15 years, usually due to the death of one of the partners. Indeed, you can see this pattern in recent hunter-gatherer societies, such as the Arche of eastern Paraguay. Women average 10 marriages by the age of 30, with men arc at 15, first child by 19, last child at 42, and on average, eight live births. Half of the people survive to 40, and average life expectancy is between 22 and 26 years. In such a high mortality society that was the norm for most of human existence, a mutation predisposing to long-lasting marriages would rarely have an effect. Most marriages ended with one partner dying. So there was no selective pressure for very long-term relationships. However, a mutation which made for a short-term relationship would be self-defeating, since the chances of survival of abandoned mothers and children is significantly lowered. So evolution favours relationships long enough to make the chances of ch children survive into adulthood high, yet not much longer than the expected survival of one of the spouses. And this is very consistent with actually today's average length of a relationship being seven to ten years. We've understood a lot about human uh, mating behaviour and uh, their patterns of, of love by studying non-human animals, in particular the voles. Voles are small rat-like creatures which inhabit the uh, plains of the United States. And two related species of voles display different uh, patterns of pair bonding. The mountain vole is characteristically polygamous. The male has a number of sexual partners. And the prairie vole is characteristically monogamous. Scientists have understood uh, the basis for this different behaviour being related to different parts of the reward centre of their brain. Indeed, scientists have successfully transferred genetic material from the brains of the monogamous voles, the monogamous prairie voles, into the polygamous mountain voles and changed their mating behaviour to be monogamous. What's all that got to do with human beings? Well, the differences in their behaviour is related to a change in a receptor in the brain called the vasopressin receptin 1A gene. We've also identified a similar gene in human beings. And, surprisingly, a recent study has shown that there is a mutation or a change in this receptor in some men. And if you carry two copies of this mutation, the so-called 334 mutation, you're more often to report marital crisis, including threat of divorce in the last year. Your partners are less likely to be satisfied. There's less likely to be consensus and cohesion. And these are significantly different to people who carry no copies of this. And this version of the gene is associated with different activity in an area of the brain known to be associated with pair bonding. So the story that unfolds is that differences in behaviour, even differences in ability to sustain a long-term relationship, have a biological basis. They differ between different individuals and we will be able, at some point, to influence that biology to achieve whatever goal we choose to achieve. 
Indeed, we can increase our fitness for love by changing the underlying biology of love. All patterns of love in human and non-human animals, or mammals anyway, follow three distinct patterns. An initial phase of lust, uh, followed by a phase of attraction, and then a, a phase of bonding or attachment, which enables uh, the young to be reared. Each of these have different neurochemical bases, and each of these can be separately manipulated. So, for example, testosterone increases uh, sexual drive in women, oxytocin promotes pair bonding, uh, even in the absence uh, of mating. So, what this story tells us is our fitness can be influenced by our evolutionary hi history and that it is amenable to understanding and amenable to change. Now, let me move on to the Bermuda Triangle of Extinction, which is a less happy story. We have a new potential this century to annihilate ourselves. Indeed, probably the greatest risk that humans face is humans themselves. Uh, a number of experts have studied the possibility of surviving the next century, including the Astronomer Royal and President of the Royal Society, Martin Rees, who's put the probability of us surviving this, this century at 50%. A number of experts convened in Oxford several months ago, and the median expectation of survival uh, was 25%. During the Cold War, only a handful of people had the ability to obliterate the world uh, through nuclear holocaust. However, technology has rapidly progressed since then. Moore's law has been relentlessly proven to be true with ex ex um, ex exponential increase of computing power doubling every two years with the expectation of reaching a singularity in 2045. What this means is that today millions of people have access to means of mass destruction. Uh, on April 16, 2007, uh, Sung Hu Cho killed 32 people in the worst civil shooting in the US history. Cho used two semi-automatic handguns and the killings only took several minutes. However, this is nothing compared to the technology which is potentially available today or in the near horizon. Dozens of countries have poorly secured stockpiles of enriched uranium. Uh, Richard Posner a Supreme Court judge who's all, also written on the possibility of surviving this century estimates there's enough uh, insecure uh, fissile material to provide raw materials for 20,000 uh, atomic bombs. Even more scary is the prospect of biological weapons. Uh, in around 2000, scientists in Canberra were experimenting on a version of mousepox in an attempt to control uh, the mouse population by rendering mice infertile. Unexpectedly, they produced a super lethal strain of mouse pox, which didn't render the mice infertile, but killed 100% of them. Uh, they published their findings on the internet, and it was immediately recognised that human smallpox could be modified in a very similar way to produce a super lethal strain of smallpox. Uh, smallpox has probably killed more people uh, throughout human history than any other incident, uh, at its peak, it killed one in three people. It was eradicated in the 1970s from vaccination. Uh, there's no reason why you couldn't create a super lethal strain today that could be distributed through aerosols in major air in international airports and cities. It has a two-week incubation period. By the time the first cases were recognised, a pandemic uh, would have resulted. Uh, this sort of technology is not um, very high technology. Um, scientists recently artificially created polio using uh, small segments of DNA uh, that could be purchased over the internet. In the next decades, there's no reason why a backyard terrorist or fanatic or psychopath couldn't create a bioweapon that would at least destroy millions of lives. So today we live in a world which is different to the world through which mo humans have mostly existed where the capacity to kill large numbers of people was fairly limited. Against this background, when we start to look at the human condition, we find very significant human imperfections. At the extreme end, we find sociopaths and psychopaths. The following is a fairly familiar story to people who read the newspaper. In 1993, two bodies were found on a country road in Ellis County, Texas. One was male, one female. 
The boy, 14, had been shot, but the 13-year-old girl had been stripped, raped and dismembered. Her head and hands were missing. The killer turned out to be Jason Massey, 20, who had decided he was going to become the worst serial killer that Texas had ever seen. He tortured animals, stalked another woman, revered killers like Ted Bundy, Charles Manson and Henry Lee Lucas. He was nine-year-old when he killed his first cat. He added dozens more over the years, along with dogs and even six cows. He had a long list of potential victims and so on. When you read the quotes from parents from psychopaths, in many cases they express the view that their child was not right from birth. Um, one, one woman said, I also have a son 18 years of age. He ex exhibited problems since childhood. He also has rages, lies, manipulates. He's off to a very good college and is extremely bright, which makes it more lethal. It's very typical of psychopaths that they're very socially competent and intelligent. He just hasn't been right since birth. He's no longer living with me and I pray he does well in life. My therapist said I did everything I possibly could, including therapy since the age of three. Well, antisocial personality disorder is five times more common in first degree biological relatives of males than the disorder uh, than the general population. The risk to first degree biological relatives of females with the disorder is nearly 10 times that of the general population. Adoption studies show that both genetic and environmental factors contribute. Um, but genetic factors play a significant role. Seventy-five percent of inmates in English and American prisons have antisocial personality disorder. Twenty-five percent of all inmates are psychopaths. At the extreme end of the human personality in the form of sociopathic and psychopathic personality disorders, there's an extreme incidence of harm to others. At the moment, such psychopaths have not had access to biological weapons. Um, it would take only one of these people to have access to the sorts of weapons that are on the horizon to wreak enormous havoc. The second problem is not one of the extreme end of the spectrum, but the problem that infects all of us, and that is the limited nature of our moral dispositions and capacity for moral behaviour. As I mentioned, through most of human history, we lived in a hunter-gatherer-like state. We lived in small groups of up to 150, were able to cooperate within that sort of group size. We had kin altruism, altruism towards our offspring and to those that we uh, knew closely. We had a bias towards the near future, our tools and other means at our disposal for that long pre-scientific period of history enabled us to only affect our immediate environment during the imminent future. We had limited possibility to cooperate at one time. When people were in small groups and their efforts could be observed, they would cooperate. In larger groups, they tended to defect and free ride. And they were distrustful of strangers and xenophobic. Through most of human history, uh, as it is today, it was much easier to harm than to benefit. So most forms of practical morality, the sorts of moral codes that people actually live by, placed significant importance on rights violating harms, so preventing people from doing harm. They placed much less importance on benefiting other people. So we think it's much worse to harm someone than it is to fail to benefit them. We also tend to have or believe that we are primarily responsible for what we actively cause in proportion to how much we caused it. This again is related to the need to prohibit harms. For that reason, we, we see that the results of our action, or we believe that the results of our actions, are more important than the results of omissions to act. We're psychologically myopic, disposed to care more about what happens in the near future to us and some individuals who are related to us or to whom we're closely acquainted. We're capable of empathising and sympathising, but only with single individuals and not with very large numbers of people in collectives. Now, these kinds of limitations have quite striking consequences today. First of all, they result in our failure to aid. In 2008, only five countries, Sweden, Luxembourg, Norway, Denmark and the Netherlands, had reached the very modest goal that the United Nations had set decades ago of aid amounting to 0.7 per cent of gross domestic product. The average for OECD nations is 0.47 per cent. Uh, and the two biggest economies, the US and Japan, lie at the bottom at about 0.2 per cent. 
Why is it that we fail to provide aid and to benefit developing countries, given enormous power to do so today? This is partly related to our adherence to the Act Emission Doctrine, the belief that somehow we're less responsible for what we fail to do. It's to do with our limited altruism. For example, Americans value a non-American life in poorer nations at about one two thousandths the value they put on American life in terms of what they'd be prepared to give to save that life. And the sheer number of subjects to whom we have to respond can also present an obstacle to the proper response. While many of you would be capable of vividly imagining the suffering of a single individual before your eyes and consequently feel strong compassion, we are unable to vividly imagine the suffering of a hundred subjects, even if they're in sight, let alone a thousand subjects when we can't see them. This insensitivity or numbness to numbers is prone to make us seriously underestimate the amount of suffering that we could fail, uh, that we could alleviate but fail to in the developing world. The second example of our moral limitations is our failure to cooperate that will contribute to our failure to respond to the environmental crisis. Now, I was just at Archbishop Pell's talk and I was interested to learn that there isn't good scientific evidence to support global warming or the contribution of humans to global warming. Um, these are clearly complicated questions. Let me just assume for argument's sake that we do think there is a problem with the, the environment and that we do believe that humans should be doing something about it. But if you don't believe in the environmental crisis, take some other global problem like the failure to aid. The environmental crisis is an example of the tragedy of the commons. Uh, in this tragedy, herdsmen will tend to overgraze a limited amount of land. They'll stop consuming only if they have good reason to believe that a sufficient number of other people will do so as well, and especially if this number will not be sufficient without their contribution. As long as the number of herdsmen involved is small, herdsmen are more likely to know each other personally and to have developed concern and trust for each other. This is how humans have developed. Likewise, if their number is small, it will be easy for them to keep an eye on each other and detect free riders. So David Hume, the famous Scottish philosopher, gives the example of two men in a rowboat. Uh, even if they don't know each other or trust each other, if one fails to row, it's obvious, and they go around in circles. So when people are in small groups and their contributions can be seen and have an effect, they tend to cooperate. But when they're in much larger groups and their contributions are much less obvious, they tend to free ride. Environmental problems that we face today are not caused by the sorts of problems of cooperation that we had through most of human history. They're, co they're, co they're caused by huge states with millions of citizens who are largely anonymous to each other and so have little reason to trust each other. The masses of people make it easy for free riders and defectors to escape notice. And humans have a tendency to free ride. As the number of agents involved in a cooperation problem grows, a stage is eventually reached at which the contribution of each agent to the total outcome is negligible or imperceptible. Then an individual agent can have no altruistic and even more so no self-interested reason to contribute. The contribution of each of us to the environmental problem and degradation is imperceptible or negligible. Thus the prohibition of ordinary common sense, morality against harming, doesn't kick in. What could make us cooperate is a sense of fairness or justice, that it would be unfair to those who contribute by cutting down on their consumption of natural resources and the release of waste to free ride on their sacrifices. <clears throat> but this feeling of unfairness will be weaker when many of the other parties are anonymous and there is no concern for them because they're strangers. Other reasons to believe that we won't solve the environmental crisis through human cooperation are the following. Firstly, as Archbishop Pell displayed previously, there's uncertainty about our contribution or the magnitude of the problem. Whatever effects will occur will occur in the further future and we're biased towards the near future. The effects will largely be borne by strangers or others in Africa and Southeast Asia. Moreover, the sustainable level of welfare that's, cons that's consistent with um, control of the environmental problem 
is much lower than we currently enjoy in Western democracies. If all six billion people alive today were to reach the standard of living of people in Western democracies, the human impact on the environment in the form of consumption of resources and the release of waste products would be 12 times higher than it is today, which is clearly unsustainable. If we were to reduce our level of well-being to a sustainable level, we would have to radically, at this point, reduce our consumption of oil, give up largely driving cars as we know them, using airline travel, and we'd have to stop eating meat. However, Western democracies have shown that their citizens are very selfish. One survey of US citizens showed that 52 per cent declared that they would refuse to support the Kyoto Protocol if it would cost an average American household an extra $50 per month. So more than half of Americans wouldn't spend more than $50 per month to contribute to combating the global crisis. Only 11 per cent would spend more than $1,000 per month. So I believe we're unlikely to change our attitudes to aid or to cooperate to solve problems that occur at a global level like the climate crisis. Liberal democracy is around 200 years old. It arose around the time of the Industrial Revolution as we were able to produce more and own more. It's characterised by empowering individuals, bestowing the maximum range of freedoms possible, tolerance and liberal neutrality between different conceptions of the good life and different value systems, multiculturalism and tolerance to minorities. However, in a world of radical technological advance, it enables violent minorities to access the means of destruction. It also provides a poor basis for cooperation and coordination at a global level, where strangers in the distant future are affected and we have very small and overdetermined contributions to the ultimate causes. There's reason to believe that our sense of fairness and our basic moral dispositions, like our patterns of sexual behaviour and our relationships, have strong biological contributors capable of being understood and being manipulated or changed. Our basic set of dispositions around justice or fairness centre around a disposition for what could be called tit-for-tat, a strategy that has enabled humans to survive and reproduce uh, and cooperate with each other and deal with and punish defectors or free riders in those small groups of 150. The central notion of tit-for-tat is the following. Someone does you a favour out of altruism. You should respond with gratitude and a desire to return the favour with a proportionate favour. Someone harms you, the proper response is anger and a desire for retaliation, the tit for tat. It's easy to see the usefulness of these responses in populations where they are widely but not completely pervasive. For adequate gratitude encourages the giving of new favours and proportionate anger discourages future aggression. If we were um, all benevolent and there were no free riders, tit for tat would not be an optimal strategy. But alas, humans tend to free ride and there tend to be groups that take advantage of others. More sophisticated emotional responses are part of the tit-for-tat strategy, so remorse or feelings of guilt if you've acted wrongly without good reason, shame if you are less successful than others in returning favour, pride if you are more successful than others in these respects, admiration or contempt for others who are successful in these, in these respects, and forgiveness when you realise that someone is not responsible for some wrong done. <clears throat> 